Hi guys, today I have brought with me a journal article. I wanted to talk through the Liftmore study, the Liftmore Randomized Controlled Trial. And Liftmore stands for Lifting Intervention for Training Muscle Osteoporosis Rehabilitation. So the full title for this study that was published in 2018 by the Journal of Bone and Mineral Research is High Intensity Resistance and Impact Training Improves Bone Mineral Density and Physical Function in Postmenopausal Women with Osteopenia and Osteoporosis. A lot of the messaging uh, surrounding the advice for people that want to care for their bone health and um, improve the strength of their bone health is really born from the results of this study and the exciting um, changes we saw in the participants in the intervention group. Amongst many other changes, we saw an increase in bone mineral density at the lumbar spine and the hip. So I'd like to today talk through the methodology. That's all I'm going to touch on today, but I am going to have lots more videos that are going to touch on lots of different aspects of this study. So keep watching and keep subscribing and keep sharing. Pausing the video here, I'm going to talk a little bit about using information from clinical studies in the real world. If you take any clinical study and you draw out the results that make you excited and you decide that you want to elicit the same results within your work or your setting, you can't actually make any claims, any evidence claims that that is definitely going to happen. Those results are definitely going to happen unless you have the exact same methodology and the exact same participants involved in your work. So in this case, I'm going to go through a methodology and I've already been through the participant profiling. Unless we follow this methodology specifically and we have the same or similar subset of society involved, we aren't necessarily going to see the results. However, as fitness professionals and um, rehabilitation therapists, we use information from studies like this to inform us with how to work. And that's um, the most exciting part of new research coming out is that we can make many claims. We can make claims that are associated with certain bits of research and we can look at the research and look at the methodology and decide whether we can modify things slightly and still hope for the same or similar results. We don't know whether people that were excluded might have seen the same improvements. Um, we also don't know that if the exercise methodology is slightly modified in different ways, whether we would see also um, similar results. And, you know, I think this is really important to note because many exercise instructors and rehabilitation therapists will use science and they will use information, capture different bits of information from science to build or be part of a program that they are prescribing. It's often can prove very difficult because of the fact that so most humans and are so 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 different and have reasons that they can do this can't do that whether they can you know commit to this many times a week but they can't commit to that week they you know so and so on and so forth or they've got something that's um, restricting them from doing some sort of movement these are important things to mention so i'm going to get to it to the participants in this study all the participants were postmenopausal women older than 58 with low bone mass and they've categorized that as being less than minus one at the hip and or the spine. So that's your T-score. For those that don't have osteoporosis, that's a one way of measuring osteoporosis. Some people might be watching this because they, they have a relative, um, maybe your mum or your dad has osteoporosis, you're looking to prevent it. So you're looking at methodologies. So they were recruited, these participants, and 
They were screened for el eligibility and exclusions. And I'm just going to list out the exclusions because they're quite important um, to understand who didn't take part in the study. We were looking at quite a healthy set of individuals. So those who were excluded were those with lower limb joint injury or surgery. Anyone that had had a recent fracture within the last 12 months or localised back pain. Anyone that was less than five years postmenopausal, anyone with a malignancy, anyone with uncontrolled cardiovascular disease, anyone with a cognitive impairment, anyone with a recent X-ray or radiation treatment, anyone with contraindications for participating in heavy physical activity, anyone with conditions known to influence bone health, for example, thyrotoxicosis, hyperparathyroidism, Paget's disease, renal disease, diabetes or immobility. Anyone taking drugs other than osteoporosis medications known to influence bone. Prolonged use of corticosteroids, thyroxine, theocides, I'm not pronouncing that one correctly, um, or unable to attend the supervised training programme if so assigned. But it's not to say that people that um, fit that characteristic would not benefit from taking part in the methodology that I'm about to go from. It's just to say that this study didn't include those people. And we, need, we do need to take note of the contraindications, of course. So the intervention exercise group. This is what they were doing. I'm not going to be talking about the control group today. However, the control group did see improvements in certain measures that were being measured. But today I'm really very much so focused on the impact that heavy weightlifting had on bone mineral density and those improvements that we saw in bone mineral density at the hip and the spine. Just before we move on, I want to let you know that this video and podcast is intended to support you in your journey as you decide on safe, effective and appropriate approaches in managing your osteoporosis or osteopenia. It is advisable that you do your own research to validate any claims of evidence-based research. Always consult with your doctor when deciding on a new exercise plan so you can both agree on whether it's suitable for you. So they were allocated and they participated for eight months, twice weekly, for 30 minutes, supervised. And the programme was high intensity resistance and impact training. And it was performed in, at the Griffith University in the Gold Coast of Australia. So here, right here, we have our first um, bit of information of methodology. The reason that this study was done um, over a period of eight months is because I, it, it's something linking in with bone markers and where we would expect to see changes in bone markers. So it was so that they could get a measure at the start and a measure at the end. So it's not to say that um, somebody that you know isn't isn't doing it for that long isn't going to see changes, but. You know, if you're going to jump on board with heavy weightlifting for any pr prevention purposes or rehabilitation purposes, generally for bone health, you're going to be on that. You want to be on that road for the rest of your life. You want it to become habit. Twice weekly, we don't know that if these participants took part in the exercises once a week, um, whether they would have still seen the same improvements. And we don't know that if they would have participated three or more times a week, if we would have seen more improvement, better improvement. We just don't know that. So this is what the study is doing. But these are little things that we could tweak and, and maybe it, it, it's not something I'm going to be too concerned with at the start. I'm not going to ask my clients to do more than twice a week, but I'm not going to give them such a hard time if they can only commit to once a week. 30 minutes, again... Can I, can I get this all done in 30 minutes? It takes a long time to set up heavy weights in a gym and I'm pretty sure that in this setting, everyone will have had their weights um, set up. They would have had person, a trainer on each station setting up weights and also there would have been the availability of the barbells and the plates would have been, it'd been there for everyone. In a, in a gym environment, sometimes you've got to wait around um, until something's available or a space is available. And hey, <laughs> Are we seeing these benefits because these 
participants were also based in Australia and the Australian sunshine is just bringing about that extra benefit and the rest of the world is really never going to measure up. Well that I'm going to just push to one side and hope, hope not that that isn't the case. To ensure safe transition to higher intensity exercise, the first month of the intervention comprised body weight and low load exercise variants with a focus on progressively learning the movement patterns of the HIRIT, that's the high intensity resistance and impact training exercises. So I'm going to call it HIRIT from now on. Great. They spent a decent length of time practicing these movements because um, ultimately the movement that were involving heavy weights were deadlifts, overhead presses and back squats. And yeah, there's a certain amount of technique needed there and it's important to get those movements right. Yeah, which uh, brings me on to my, my work and the work that I do online. I, I'm very much so educating people in movement so that they are moving in a safe and sensible manner. So a lot of my clients that have been with me for years would need to do that warm up because they are already doing it with me twice a week. They've been doing it with me for years and they are, are drilled at technique. Some of them though that might have certain um, shapes in their spine, I would ask them to be working at a lesser depth for example because it's so difficult for them to prevent their kyphosis from pulling forward. So I'm not going to touch on the impact exercise today that was in the study, just going to stick with the, the heavy weights. And uh, yeah they performed the remainder of the intervention in five sets of five repetitions, maintaining an intensity of more than 80 to 85% of their one repetition max. So for those that don't know weightlifting terminology, um, five sets, um, five repetitions, it's a repetition of anything. So if this is what I'm doing, I'm going to do it five times then I'm going to take a rest because that was my first set and then I'm going to do it another five times. These are my five reps, repetitions, and then I'm going to take a rest and then I'm going to do it the third time and so and so forth until I hit number five. And they, um, they went pretty heavy. They went um, to 80 to 85 percent. Um, which is great, but we, we, again, we do not know that if these people were training to a lesser um, intensity, so 70 to 75%, we don't know because there's no study showing us, there's no study showing me, um, whether we would see the same results or similar results, improvements in bone mineral density. We also don't know that if these, these, um, Participants were taking part and, and lifting heavier weights, um, heavier, heavier in terms of percentage anyway, like up to 90%, whether we'd see more improvements or more harm. You know, it, it more doesn't necessarily mean better. That's something I've definitely learned over the years. Um, participants performed up to two sets of deadlifts at 50 to 70%, deadlifts is just one of the exercises, 50 to 70% of one repetition ma maximum to serve as a warm up as required. Yes, super important. We're not going straight for the load that we are aiming for. We are picking a load that's still going to be challenging and seeing how we feel. Any warm up is there to kind of ask the joints, the muscles, the body, the person, how are you feeling today? Is anything complaining? Are your muscles complaining? Are your joints complaining? Is your mood not, are you feeling, are you feeling okay? And really using that as an indication of whether we should be heading onto our heavy or heavier weightlifting sets. And um, that's a super important thing that needs to happen. In fact, I would do a no weight warm up first of all, always. I would do three, three to five repetitions with no weights. And then I'd head into um, about 15 repetitions um, for my warm up with weight. And then I'd head to the heavier weight and just see how I feel. I like to measure each time actually what my 80 to 85% is. I don't, um, I go for it, but then I, I, you can't assume that it's the same in any one week. I'm going to skip all the next bit because it's it's very much so related to the impact training and then just move to the end where it said each exercise session was performed in small groups with a maximum of eight participants per instructor. 
Trainers have since picked up this methodology and they've understood how to use it. Um, I do believe it's super important that you find a trainer that is going to look after you and supervise you because we're, this is this is heavy, heavy, heavy stuff and we want to be doing it right and you want to be progressing and building up to those heavy weights. You don't want to be rushing and any trainer that's working with you that's rushing to get you there move them out and get get with the right trainer please um message me contact me um in my my phone number's available my email's available you can comment here below i'm based in london um the uk and i look forward to the conversations that are going to start you're going to see more videos um surrounding this lift more topic um so keep watching and subscribing and don't forget to share